Welcome back, back with another banger. It's the React Files. Hope you're having a good night. If you haven't already, please take a second just to smash that like, subscribe, ring that notification bell. Just to make sure the algorithm knows what's up. So let's get straight to it. To how, yo, <laughs> either he's a good actor or this dude was possessed by the full moon. I'm on the fence with this one. What do you think? Let me know in the comments down below. So one day, this woman and a pizza delivery guy, they pull up to a dairy farm and they get out of the car and she hands him a pew pew and he takes it and he raises it up and he points it at her head and he pulls the trigger. So her name's Natalie, she's 19. And one day she becomes friends with a local homeless guy, this guy, Sean. And she helps Sean whenever she can with rides and stuff. But over time, Sean starts to get a little too close to Natalie and he starts getting obsessed with her. So she slowly starts distancing herself from him, but it's not working. So eventually she puts her foot down. I don't want to see you anymore. And Sean, he doesn't take this well at all. So he starts freaking out. He starts parking outside her house and sleeping outside of where she works. Of course, at this point, Natalie's doing everything she can to keep him away from her. She avoids his calls. She blocks him. She even files a restraining order against him and around that time she gets on Facebook and makes a post telling everyone Sean has been stalking her and to ignore him and that he's mentally unwell and that is where things go wrong because around a week later Natalie's boyfriend this guy who we'll just call boyfriend he gets home from work and strangely Natalie's not there but all her stuff is plus his pew pew his Glock is missing and boyfriend knows something's wrong so he immediately calls the police my girlfriend got a protection order against this man who's been stalking her for quite some time and I came home and she Missing. And boyfriend tells them about Sean. So now police got to call Sean in. So they call him in. They question him for a while. And Sean says he doesn't know anything about this or about where Natalie is. And police don't have any evidence against him. So they let him go. And then Sean goes and makes a video about this. And he posts it on his YouTube channel. The Broomfield Police Department just got a hold of me. The next day, a hiker is out hiking in the woods near a local dairy farm. And suddenly he stumbles across a body. Natalie's body. She had been unalived shot in the head. 
and everyone is immediately suspicious of Sean. I mean, they had all seen Natalie's Facebook post from a week ago. They know he's been stalking her. So they all start bringing this up in the comments of Natalie's Facebook post. And they're all making other posts and they're saying, Sean definitely had something to do with this. Police need to look into him again. And Sean, he sees all these accusations and he doesn't like it. So he's got to go on Facebook Live to defend himself. And there he basically says, sure, I'm a weird guy, but I'm not a killer. But that doesn't work. In fact, his response to all this just makes the backlash worse. And soon word gets out and people are talking about it locally and reporters are chasing Sean around trying to get him to admit that he knows something about Natalie's death and all this ends up being too much for Sean. So he starts posting on his Facebook about wanting to unalive himself and people see this and they immediately report it to the police and then police they go and do a wellness check on him. They show up to where he is and he is not doing so good. So they take him to a treatment center and there he starts freaking out and yelling and I guess he assaults a police officer and of course they got to arrest him for that. Here's his mugshot. And once Sean gets arrested, the internet and some of Natalie's family members, they all start rejoicing. And everyone's celebrating and everyone's happy. I mean, Natalie's killer just got arrested. Until suddenly police let Sean go again. And not only that, they clear his name. So I guess Sean was right. He's a weird guy, but he didn't kill Natalie. Now at this point in the story, police have looked at everything they can, but they have no more leads. But then about a month goes by and they finally get a hold of Natalie's phone records because it takes a while to get phone records. Once those records come in, police find over a hundred messages to and from a number they don't recognize. That number belongs to this guy who we'll call Pizza Man. So police find Pizza Man and they bring him in for questioning. And there, Pizza Man says, yeah, he met Natalie once, but he really doesn't know what this is all about. So then Pizza Man starts bullshitting and he changes his story a bunch of times. But then after a lot of questioning, he finally admits that, yeah, he does know Natalie. And also he was with her when she died. And then he goes on to tell them a version of what possibly happened to her. Here's what Pizza Man claims ultimately happened. About a week after making that Facebook post about Sean, Natalie wakes up in a real bad place. She's depressed. She's having issues with her boyfriend. She's got this guy stalking her. She's also got some drug issues she's been dealing with. She's a whole mess. And so she's thinking about unaliving herself, but she can't actually bring herself to do it. And that is when she gets a crazy idea. She'll put an ad on Craigslist looking for a hitman and that hitman can come unalive her. So she goes to her computer and she types up this ad and she posts it. And like who the hell would possibly reply to this ad? Well, minutes later, someone actually does reply. Pizza Man. And he tells her, yeah, he can do it. He says he's a hitman. In fact, not only is he a hitman, he says he's an experienced hitman. But in reality, he's not. He's just a guy who works works at Domino's. So Pizza Man and Natalie, they start texting back and forth a ton. And Natalie tells him she's serious about this and she wants it to be over with quick. And she asks him if he has a pew pew to do it with. And Pizza Man's like, no. And she's like, all good, I have one. And she goes and gets her boyfriend's Glock. Later that day, Pizza Man drives over to pick her up. So he gets there and then she gets in his car and they drive around for a few hours and they're looking for the perfect spot to do this in. And eventually they find that perfect spot. It's near the woods on this dairy farm. So they stop at the farm and Natalie Natalie hands Pizza Man the Glock and Pizza Man is like, are you sure you want to do this? And Natalie's like, don't try and talk me out of it. So then Pizza Man raises up the pew pew and he points it at her and he closes his eyes and he pulls the trigger, shooting her in the head, just like she asked him to. So then he grabs her purse and he throws the purse and the Glock in the trunk of his car and then he drives away. That is the story Pizza Man told police, that she wanted to unalive herself and all he did was help her do it and no one knows how true his story is. Regardless, it's still legally murder. So they arrest Pizza Man, here's his mugshot, he takes a plea deal, and he's sentenced to 48 years in prison. Shout out to Craigslist and Domino's. Here. Grandpa isn't here right now. Grandpa. Here. No, he isn't here. He's gone, Molly, what are you looking at? Grandpa, Grandpa can you hear me? Yeah. Oh my God.
some spooky joints. Grandpa took a seat in the couch. Head popping out cabinets. Shower curtain moving on its own. At that point, it's time to call a priest or cancel the lease. This is the winner of Eurovision 2024, Nemo. Representing Switzerland, this person is also wearing a crown of thorns that was given by one of the runner-ups named Bambi Thug that represents Ireland. Now, before I show you why you don't play with God and the crown of thorns, I don't know if you know what she did for her performance. I made a whole video on it, so you can just check that out, but it was a full-on satanic ritual along with demonic possession. I mean, she literally admitted it herself. Watch this real quick. Do you know, do you know what makes me special? I'm a queer. And I'm a witch! Alright, sorry you had to see that, but Nemo goes up on stage and he grabs his award for getting first place in the whole contest. Once he claims it, he goes out and celebrates in front of the stage and just look what happens. Once he places his trophy on the ground, it shatters. just break the code I also broke the trophy and I uh, broke <laughs> my thumb as well never seen a Eurovision this sucks he broke his trophy Wait. oh my god oh my god what the yo what Bro, up in the attic, that mannequin started moving all on its own. No, I, I kid you not. Which mannequin? What? <laughs> that one there. I don't know if this GoPro is catching because it's dark. But this fucking thing. Is it, a, uh, is it like a remote control thing? It's gotta have batteries if it was moving. Is that a ball? That's a ball. That ball just started moving. I, dude, what the f I got that on camera, I think. I think the GoPro picked up on that. Bro, I can't breathe. Holy shit, that was scary. I went out of this room. I think at that point, everything will feel like it's moving. Late night in an abandoned attic definitely would creep me out. What if I told you that I know exactly what the Grand Canyon is? Would you believe me? Then I know exactly why it looks like petrified flesh and has all the signs of petrified living tissue and then i showed you what the veins of a bat's wing looks like and what the grand canyon looks like and then i remind you or tell you for the very first time if you haven't seen my dragon video what i found right near that area look at this outlined in red wing torso and head even down to its molars and jagged teeth. There's a dragon there, and the Grand Canyon is that dragon's petrified veins. Try to tell me I'm wrong. Try. Now to the uninitiated to my dragon post, go check it out, but quick recap. Here is the whole dragon in red. I outlined it in blue. What I found later is the wing actually comes up and around and the head. Here's the head. They even call the mouth the Black Dragon Reservoir and Black Dragon Trailhead or a canyon. There is a dragon there and the entire Grand Canyon is its petrified vein. And just so you can see the comparisons again. And yeah, the Grand Canyon you can't explore all of it just like you can't explore Antarctica because there's all sorts of hidden things there that they don't want you to know about cultures that existed there that they don't want you to know existed there. But the bigger secret, the biggest secret of the Grand Canyon is what it actually is. And you try to tell me that's not the head of a giant dragon and that you're now looking at its neck and that this entire thing here is in its wing and its veins. Try to tell me. 
try. Oh, and of course, I'm just joking. This is all for entertainment purposes. Just like to make you guys laugh. If that's true, then giants are huge. Because that'd be the size of like three Godzillas. So you guys know how we're entering the age of Aquarius. The worlds are merging and the veil is lifting. So we're going to start seeing things that we have never seen before. So as I was digging through these Aurora Borealis pictures, I came across this. Check this out. Do you guys see what I see? Do you guys see three giant entities in this picture, y'all? This is no camera tricks, y'all. This is in Slovenia. There are three giant entities standing in this picture. Look, one, two, and three. Like Jack and the Beanstalk, they told us about these beans, right? Look at these legs. Look at this dude's arms, y'all. Look at him, huh? They told us about the giants, the Nephilim, y'all. What the heck? Can y'all see that, right? You guys see that? We are literally tapping into another world, another frequency. Because what did you guys feel the other night? The energy was intense, y'all. And now we know why. Because there is huge beings on this plane right now. The veil between worlds are lifting, y'all. They told us about this. We are going through a change, a shift in frequency. Because when have we ever seen beautiful colors like this, especially all over the planet? You know, almost all over the planet. So what do you guys see here, y'all? Again, remember when we seen that huge Grim Reaper earlier this year? Remember that? Remember that? Now look at these three giant beings. That's crazy. Like I told y'all, man, things are going to get a lot more interesting. In 2024, it started out with a bang. Remember the South Antarctic anomaly? No one has yet explained that. And now look at this, y'all. So let me know what you guys think about this video, y'all. This video is strictly for entertainment purposes only. I am only raising awareness to interesting situations during these interesting times. What do you guys think about this? Like, comment, and share for more videos like this. Thank you for tuning to my frequency. Let's get this shift. Peace in. I love you, Grandma, but you gotta go. What was she doing in that last clip? I don't even wanna know. On May 17th, 2024, the Vatican will release a detailed document providing guidance on how to discern supernatural phenomena, apparitions, appearances, or communication with divine beings, such as saints, angels, or Christ himself. The last time the Vatican released guidance on apparitions was in 1978 under Pope Paul VI. That document, norms regarding the manner of proceedings in the discernment of presumed apparitions or revelations, was released due to the increased influence of mass media. The miracle of Fatima in 1917 is perhaps the most well-documented apparition in the modern day. After an alleged series of appearances by the Virgin Mary to several peasant children that promised a public miracle, Tens of thousands of people in Fatima claimed to witness the sun move erratically across the sky and produce radiant colors for several minutes. Project Bluebeam is a conspiracy theory that claims that NASA and other government agencies are attempting to implement a New Age religion with the Antichrist at its head and start a new world order via a technologically simulated second coming. This theory was put forth by a man named Serge Monast a Canadian journalist who published the theory in 1994. According to Monast, Project Blue Beam would involve several steps. The first step would allegedly involve faking discoveries that would discredit all fundamental religious doctrines. Then three-dimensional optical holograms and sounds would be projected into the sky, 
simulating figures important to various cultures and religions, which would merge into one after explanations of their individual mistakes. Telepathic electronic means would be used to communicate with each individual on Earth, convincing them that their God is speaking to them directly. The final step would supposedly use electronic means to create the illusion of an alien invasion, or the perception of the rapture and return of Jesus, to manipulate believers into accepting the new religion. Monist claimed that his work exposing Project Blue Beam had made him a target for harassment by government authorities which he believed was part of a campaign to silence him. According to reports and his own accounts, Monist and another journalist were repeatedly arrested and had their children taken away by authorities, ostensibly due to their involvement in publicizing conspiracy theories, which the government found disruptive or threatening. Monist attributed his legal and personal troubles to his stance against what he believed to be a global conspiracy. He ultimately died of a heart attack in 1996, which some claim was induced or somehow facilitated by government agents as a way to permanently silence him. Y'all, something really weird is going on in the world. Do you remember that strong storm and flooding in Dubai? Well, you know, the sky turned green while it was going on. But that's not the only thing going on in the skies. Every day on TikTok, I'm seeing some kind of glitch or some kind of crazy change in the sky. Every day. Now I do have a hypothesis for this that we'll get to in a minute, but this has been going on for about a year all over the world. So what I'm wondering is, is the sky a projection? And that brings me to another thought. I know y'all have seen this, the Vatican prepares guidelines for apparitions and other supernatural phenomenon. But I want you to know something very, very particular. Appearance or communication with divine beings such as saints, angels, or Christ himself it seems like we're about to see something that says that they're Christ. I remember one dream as a child and it was being overtook and the whole entire sky was overtooken by UFOs and I remember it so vividly. I don't remember any dream as a kid but that one. And as an adult, I had basically the same exact dream except they were descending upon New York. Now, do y'all remember where it allegedly came out that NASA had hired theologians? Well, you know, you have the AP saying this did not happen, right? News 18 said it happened. The Hill said it happened. The Times said it happened. Now back to the apparitions of possibly even Christ himself. We know that Satan, the great deceiver, the prince of the air, can also manifest as an angel of light. And then when we had the eclipse, we literally had the devil's comet show itself. To me, my opinion, it kind of feels like Satan's getting ready to show himself, just not as himself. Being the prince and power of the air, would he not be able to control what the sky looked like? I'm just saying. What do y'all think? I've showed you three out of thousands of videos, by the way. Project BB. It's crazy they would release an article like that. As you were just seeing in the video before, the story starting to pick up steam. So did you guys know that the Vatican is preparing people to see apparitions and supernatural phenomena like ghost-like fourth dimensional entities? So apparently the Vatican is preparing people because we are about to be seeing supernatural beings, demons, apparitions. And so they're getting ready to give us a guidelines, right? And so even schools are setting up drill tests in case aliens come. This teacher went on record to say that. Schools are having drills, test lockdowns for skinwalkers. Last but not least, they're preparing you for the demon face syndrome. In my opinion, two things are going to go down. The fake alien invasion, or they're going to release demonic creatures above ground. And interestingly enough, I just showed you how ghost-like apparitions was photographed in Sylvania during the huge aurora borealis showing, y'all, that was happening across the whole planet. Y'all see that over here. Here's one huge giant. Look at this. Here's another one and then another one. Big entities just chilling there, looking old, looking looking over the horizon. So the Vatican knows that we are going through the shift now and we're gonna start seeing these type of beings. That's why they're getting us ready for this. But yes, y'all, no coincidence. Y'all see this. What do you guys think about this video? Please let us know down in the comments below. This video is strictly for entertainment purposes only. I am only raising awareness to interesting situations during these interesting times. Like, comment, and share for more videos like this. Thank you for tuning to my frequency. Let's get this shift, y'all.
Peace in. While many of you are blocking celebrities for what happened at the Met Gala, not a lot of you are talking about the theme behind the Met Gala, the garden theme, or more specifically, the Garden of Time by J.G. Ballard. And this was first brought to my attention by another content creator on the platform. I reposted their video you can find on my page. They explain it very beautifully. But I want to go over very briefly, shortly, what the Garden of Time was. And by explaining that, you'll understand why the elites are sort of throwing things in your face. They see the writings, the pictures, and the paintings on the wall. And it's a very short story you can find online yourself. Essentially, we have two very wealthy and rich people that live in a villa by themselves, overlooking an entire horizon and plain of beautiful nothingness. And in that villa, underneath their terrace, is a garden. A garden of crystal roses. These crystal roses are about two meters in height, completely clear and have a diamond on the inside. And they're roses or, or flowers of time. Each time you pluck one, time goes backwards. Your man notices that over time there's a crowd of angry mob of people over the horizon getting closer and closer. So he goes ahead and plucks a flower every time one of these mobs or they get closer. And he recedes them and pushes them back. But the garden is dying. There aren't that many more flowers. None at all, and specifically about a dozen. And he tries to put this brave facade of being a brave warrior and a soldier for his woman. But he knows that his time is ending. And the flowers are getting smaller and the time is getting less. In the story, it's painted out that they are sort of the victims here. And the mob is zombified, empty, mobless parasites that hoard and kill everything along their way. And the story ends with the... I won't tell you the ending. I want you to go ahead and read the story. It's very interesting and very good. What I will say is that every time they pluck a flower, time resets. There is a great reset in works. The elites, the powers that had control over time have lost their power. And now they are seeking to reset everything because the mass is enclosing on their villa. And they'll be damned if anybody gets anything of theirs. Very interesting. I didn't know that's what the gallery was based off of. There's definitely a parallel. Real Hunger Games type stuff. What in the world is going on in Ashgabat, Turkmenistan? I mean, not only do they have all of this craziness going on, but there's also a giant crater that's always on fire. That kind of reminds me of the craters I've talked about in my other videos, if you catch my drift. But this isn't the craziest part, no. The craziest part about all this, even though they have things that look like Lucifer's torch and the egg of Ishtar and a giant plunger, the craziest thing weird going on whatsoever. I've never heard of that place. Looking at it, it looks like the capital of the Hunger Games. Commissioned by Pope Paul VI in 1965 and completed in 1977, La Resurrezione is a dramatic depiction of Christ rising from the turmoil of an atomic explosion. At 66 feet wide and 23 feet high, this sculpture dominates the stage of the Pope Paul VI audience hall, serving as a backdrop for papal audiences and significant events. Pericle Fazzini, known for his dynamic and expressive style, was chosen for this project. His vision, he claimed, was to create a sculpture that not only embodied the resurrection of Christ, but also resonated with the contemporary world a world shadowed by the threat of nuclear destruction. The figure of Christ, cast in bronze, emerges from the abstract chaos with an almost expressionless face. His outstretched arms and upward gaze draw the viewer's eyes towards the heavens. Fazzini's work, while undeniably bold, can be polarizing. The chaotic forms and the depiction of an atomic explosion as the backdrop for Christ's resurrection are jarring for those accustomed to more classical interpretations. So this guy, his name's Jerome, and Jerome is about to steal $24 million from McDonald's? So Jerome, he used to be a cop, but now he's a director of security at a marketing firm. And one day, the marketing firm he works for comes up with a promotion for one of its biggest clients, McDonald's. And in this promotion, they combine McDonald's and Monopoly into a game where customers win free French fries or free drinks or the grand prize, $1 million. And this game? 
blows up like it is massively popular. And Jerome, as director of security, he's in charge of transporting those winning game pieces from the company to the factory. And this is a very secure process. The pieces are locked up in a case in envelopes with tamper sealed tape on them. And they have an auditor shadow Jerome around anytime he has the case. And the auditor's always looking over his shoulder. Like when he travels with the case, the auditor has to sit next to him on the plane. McDonald's is hardcore. But then one day, Jerome figures out how to steal one of the winning game pieces worth $25,000. Now Jerome, he can't cash this piece in himself because he works for McDonald's. It would look suspicious. So he gives it to his stepbrother to cash in to see if anyone at corporate notices the piece is missing. And surprise, surprise, no one does. So his plan works flawlessly. So of course, Jerome's like, dope, I'm gonna do it again. And he starts stealing more of these winning game pieces and he starts selling them to people he knows. And he makes a little cash on the side doing this. And this scam goes on for several years. But then one day, something crazy happens. Jerome is chilling at home and a package is delivered. And he opens it up and he sees like a roll of tape, the same tamper safe tape they used to seal up the envelopes with the winning game pieces. I guess the supplier had accidentally mailed the tape to Jerome's house instead of the McDonald's factory. So Jerome sees this and he immediately sees an opportunity to make even more money. So then boom, sometime later he's at the airport and he's transporting the case with the winning pieces in it. And the auditor, she's there with him. And so Jerome tells her he needs to use the restroom. And then he takes the case in there with him. And then he gets one of the envelopes. He breaks the seal. He pockets the winning game pieces and replaces them with losing game pieces. Then he seals the envelope back up with the tape he got. He then later sells those winning pieces to more people he knows. And they all cash in. So much so that after a while, Jerome starts telling those people to resell those pieces to people in other states to make it all harder to track back to Jerome. And with this strategy, Jerome starts stealing more and more pieces and he distributes them out to more and more people in his network to sell. And at some point, he even brings on a couple of recruiters and they help him get his winning tickets out to people across the country. And his network just keeps getting bigger and bigger. He even jacks some of the million dollar prize pieces. One of them, Jerome anonymously donates to St. Jude's Children's Hospital because I guess he feels bad about all the stealing he's doing. I don't know, but Jerome's scheme is working and he and his friends are getting paid until eventually McDonald's starts getting suspicious because a lot of these prize winners are strangely clustered around the Georgia Florida area when people should be winning all across the country plus here's the biggest problem with this scam with a system like this the more people you involved the more people know about the scheme and one day one of those people not sure who they hit up the FBI and they're like I heard about a guy running a McDonald's monopoly scheme and this helps the FBI FBI connect the dots back to Jerome. So McDonald's execs, they find out about this and they want to shut the game down. But the FBI convinces them to run the promotion one last time. And this time they wiretap Jerome and the other suspects phones. Then when the suspects all go to cash in their stolen game pieces, McDonald's tells them there's been a delay in sending the prize money. This delay forces all the suspects to wait on getting paid. And while they're waiting, they get paranoid and they panic and they start contacting contacting each other on the phone and they complain about how they never received their prize money from McDonald's and how the stolen game pieces aren't working. And since their phones are tapped, all of these conversations are used to incriminate them. So the FBI arrests Jerome, here's his mugshot, and they uncover his whole fraud scheme. And when all is said and done, over 50 people are convicted for scamming McDonald's out of $24 million worth of winning game pieces. Now Jerome, he actually ends up snitching on his employer, the marketing firm he worked for. Because separately from all this, the firm was rigging the Monopoly game too in a different way. And that's a whole other story. But because he snitched, Jerome only got 37 months in prison. And of course, they seized all his assets. So, shout out to the Hamburglar, I guess. Jerome ruined the monopoly from McDonald's for all of us. Shout out to the real Ray Williams. What a story. So you're telling me I never had a chance. in the dishwasher. This is the shard we found. Exhibit A. And the way that it is... Don't put it in. <laughs> it's 
it's rounded, so it's supposed to go like that with the lip of the cup on top. And that's the way that it would fit. Okay, so I just broke this plate and I was making sure I had all the pieces and I found this. It's banned by the church and it says there are three kinds of humans and which one you are indicates how close you are to escaping the material world. First up we have the hylix or the material humans. These kinds of humans are obsessed with the physical world and the here and now. According to the tripartite tractate, these kinds of people are going to return to the physical world again and again in the cycle of reincarnation. The second kind are called the psychics and not psychics like reading minds or predicting the future, but as in thinkers, people who think about themselves and exist they're on the fence caught between the physical world and something more. Third, we have the pneumatics or the soul seekers. These are the kinds of humans who are connected to the spiritual and the divine, always looking for deeper meaning and cosmic truths. They see past the illusion of the material world and their souls are on the way to liberation. The big question is, which one are you? It honestly depends on what I smoke and how much. This is what's called a water tight door. So he's going to crank it. People have been asking me about making a bunker that could go underwater during a tsunami. This would be the kind of door that you would have. Go ahead and crank the handle from the other side. Let's see how it works, what it looks like. See, everything's moving there. Wow, that is nice. It's all stainless and steel. But if you guys want to go in a bunker when a tsunami hits, this would be the door that I would use in your bunker. Comment below, what do you think? Do you like it? It's stainless and steel. So, just what in the hell is going on with these trees? Recently, we have come across several videos of trees seemingly moving autonomously. At first, this seems impossible. Is this CGI? Special effects? AI generated video? What could possibly be causing this? Could this be some unknown subterranean creature moving the trees, or the trees themselves relocating to new locations? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. Are you still trying to figure out who that really is? Even after my first video? My first video where I make a pretty convincing case that this is no coincidence. But if you're still not convinced, hang on to your seats because I got some new information and it all stems from this beautiful state. Well, like it's all by design. Symbolism is everywhere. I think the key is to pay attention. Y'all, is this real? You're gonna say no, it's not real. Look at this dude's foot. Little Wayne is literally a goat. Now hold on, let's back up for a minute. Let's zoom really close in to his feet. Yeah, that's really weird, right? The only way this is possible is if his feet are split down the middle like that. Otherwise, that would not work. I also referenced many other pictures of Lil Wayne in his shoes to see what size he wore, to see that's his normal size. So please tell me what's happening in Lil Wayne's shoe. Is he really the GOAT? Before you say AI or Photoshop, I gotcha. I did photo forensics to find out that no, these pictures were not altered from their original state. Not by CGI or Photoshop. It must be AI then, right? No, this is a legitimate picture of Lil Wayne and his feet. Yo, what is going on right now? Isn't Lil Wayne the first one who started talking about he's the GOAT? It's really not far-fetched considering the Bible addresses these half-goat, half-human things. And the satire shall dance there. Satire. 
And with the Hebrew we get Sair. A satire may refer to a demon-possessed goat like the swine. Hairy, masculine, noun. They are also addressed in a different portion of Isaiah with dragons, which by the bones of dinosaur bones we knew the dragons were real. Christopher Columbus said dragons were real. Ancient Russia says dragons are real. The Bible also calls them devils. Little hairy devils. And I'm really sure that Lil Wayne was the first person to come out to say that he was the goat. The hooves don't lie. He's only told you a hundred times, I'm not a human being. How about the fact that Lil Wayne came out of nowhere and was a child at the house of Birdman who was somehow in charge of him? Maybe some kind of faunish industry puppet? Look, y'all need to stop. It's right freaking there and I showed you it's real. Shout out to Inspired by the King. I think these are called Tabby Shoes. A lot of people were wearing them at the Met Gala. So there's a Gnostic prison planet psyop going on. If you Google Gnosticism, your top hits are probably going to be the sort of caveat that Gnostics believe this is a prison planet created by the demiurge or a fallen being. It's a corrupted place and there's no good thing in the material realm and we're all trapped here in a prison. Right. This is what I've heard a lot of times when I when I see online and I look at Gaia TV and YouTube and very famous spiritual or consciousness speakers say this. And it's really frustrating because they're not actually even practicing Gnostics and it's literally a total lie when you look at the actual Nag Hammadi library in the scriptures. That's not even close to what the scriptures say. And I believe that people are saying this to throw people off the shamanic indigenous wisdom of Gnostic Christianity, right? And let's just remember that the Gnostics were one of the first indigenous groups to be by this Yahweh Zionist empire, by the fundamentalist empire. Right. They came for the Gnostics first because we had a message that went counter to the fundamentalist Christian message and the Old Testament God. Right. So the Nag Hammadi scriptures tell us quite explicitly that this earth was created by our mother Sophia. She is a being that comes from incorruptibility in the one. She's in the Pleroma. She comes down. She becomes the earth itself. And because of her act of creation, a being called the Demiurge is created. He opens his eyes and he doesn't know where he's come from. He's totally ignorant. And he says that he is the creator because he's forgotten that he was created, that there's a higher power than him. He believes he's created. The scriptures literally say this. He thinks he's the creator, but he's not the creator. The scriptures explicitly say this. Right. So he carries on and creates the archons and they are the rulers and the authorities. And the Gnostics tell us that the rulers and the authorities, i.e. governments that control us and these systems that we choose to live under are the demiurges systems of reality. He's creating on the body of Sophia. We're not saying that Sophia and the earth has fallen. No, we're saying that there's a being on earth called the demiurge who thinks he's the creator, but he's not because he's that ignorant. So there are people who are trapped in demiurgic thinking, right? So they are trapped. It's not like everything's a prison planet and we're, this whole place is corrupted. No, there are people trapped in ignorance and they follow these systems of authority. You can see right now there's a genocide going on and all the demiurges, Zionistic um, systems of media and government and all of it are convincing people that this is okay, right? So they're in a state of mind control because they're living in the Demiurge's matrix, right? The Demiurge who thinks he's God, he gets to take, he's chosen, I'll exploit, this land is mine, people, we're the chosen ones. So the Gnostics say the Demiurge is actually Yahweh, right? But we never ever say that this earth has fallen. No, on the contrary, we say that this earth is Sophia herself, her actual body. We're on the planetary mother. This is her body we live on. And there's an Eden dimension. The truth of this place is interconnectedness and the language of nature and this um, deep experience of life. That's the truth about what the Gnostics believe and what actually is written in our scriptures. But this whole prison planet BS is a psyop because if the you know the majority of the world is Abrahamic, this world is in a state of strife, 
patriarchy war, no surprises, because we have a demented demiurge Yahweh, Old Testament God, who cut down the tree, he cut down nature, and then he started to colonize everyone. That's the demiurge's reality. It's not my reality. And that's what the Gnostics were saying. Yeah, this guy exists. He's absolutely mental. Watch out for him. His name is also Yahweh. He's the Old Testament God. And this is the truth over here. So please don't believe the fallen, you know, prison planet BS. That's absolute. That's an absolute lie. Um, you know, and the same people on Gaia TV saying this kind of thing love to spew the whole, you know, alien narrative. You know, we won't talk about the actual Zionists and the aliens like exploiting people on Earth, people that have lost their souls. We're going to make you believe in some aliens coming down from the sky. There's always a diversion going on with these people. Well, that was a lot. Mother Gaia Sophia, first time hearing of this. So one day, a pizza delivery man is out delivering pizzas. But when he shows up to the delivery address, there appears to be no one there. It's just an empty field with a TV tower in it. So he gets out of his car, and then suddenly, three people appear. And they've got pew pews pointed at him. And they grab him, and they lock a collar around his neck. A collar that contains a bomb. And then they hand him a nine-page long handwritten note that tells him they need him to rob a bank for them. And if he doesn't follow these very specific instructions, the bomb will go off and he'll die. So the pizza man, his name's Brian. And poor Brian, he doesn't know what to do. And they suddenly hand him a shotgun that's modified to look like a walking cane. This is an actual picture of the walking cane shotgun. I guess to help him protect himself while he robs this bank for them. And then they're like, okay, Brian, the clock is ticking. We'll be watching. Minutes later, Brian pulls up to the bank. And with the collar bomb still on him, he walks inside. And he goes up to the counter and he slips the bank teller a note that says to put $250,000 in a bag. Now the teller, I guess she can't get $250,000, so she puts around $8,700 into a bag. And she gives it to Brian, and Brian leaves. And he gets in his car, and the instructions tell him to go to a nearby McDonald's. So he speeds to the McDonald's to get the next clue, which ends up being a note hidden under a rock there. So Brian gets the note, and then he drives away toward the next location to find whatever clue is after that. But that is when police finally catch up to him for the bank robbery. And then they get him out of his car, and then they handcuff him. And poor Brian's like, wait! But I'm a hostage! And then he tells them about the three people who put the bomb around his neck and made him do all this. So police, they see the bomb and they immediately call the bomb squad. And Brian, he tries to tell them, like, you don't understand! I don't have time! I need to finish this scavenger hunt or this bomb will go off! And as the bomb ticks away, it gets louder and louder. And Brian, he gets more and more anxious. And a bit of time passes and the bomb squad hasn't shown up yet. And everyone's just kind of standing around waiting for them. And he feels like no one is listening to him. And then suddenly, kaboom, the bomb explodes and Brian is unalived. Now, because this is such an unusual case, the FBI gets involved. And pretty quickly, they get contacted by this guy, William. And William tells them, hey, look, I had nothing to do with any collar bomb, but I know who did. And he tells them that the mastermind behind this whole bank robbery is this other woman who lives in that town. This woman, Marjorie. And then William also tells them that Marjorie had unalived her own boyfriend with poison and then paid William $2,000 to hide the boyfriend's body in his freezer. Well, now we're getting somewhere. So then the FBI finds the boyfriend's body in William's freezer and they go and they arrest Marjorie. Now Marjorie, she claims she's innocent in this whole collar bomb thing, but she ends up taking a plea deal for unaliving her boyfriend and they throw her in prison. So how did William know that Marjorie was allegedly the mastermind behind the bank heist? Well, unfortunately for the FBI, William can't answer too many questions because within about a year, he dies from cancer. So they get no more information out of him, which is a bummer for the investigation. But then, about six months after getting sent to prison, Marjorie suddenly decides she wants to cooperate with the FBI, thinking maybe they'll lighten her sentence or transfer her to a minimum security prison. So she sits down with the FBI and she admits to them that she was actually involved in the collar bomb plot and that her former boyfriend, the one she unalived, knew about the collar bomb and he threatened to snitch on her. That's why she says she unalived him and had William put him in the freezer. But then, to make this even more confusing, the FBI suddenly gets a random tip about another guy involved in the bomb plot. This guy, 
Barnes. Now Barnes, he's already in prison for an unrelated drug charge. So the FBI goes to the prison and they interview him. And he admits that yes, he actually was involved in the collar bomb plot, but he says that William, the guy who died of cancer, was actually the mastermind behind the whole thing, not Marjorie. He says William was really the one who sat down and constructed the whole collar bomb and he built the shotgun cane thing himself. He was handy like that. So Barnes, he pleads guilty to his involvement in the plot and he gets 45 years in prison. But then, a couple of years into his sentence, Barnes changes his story and he tells the FBI that while William did build the collar bomb device, he wasn't actually the mastermind. Instead, it was Marjorie the whole time. She was the mastermind. He says Marjorie came up with this whole collar bomb plan to rob the bank for $250,000 and that she wanted that $250,000 so that she could use it to hire a hitman and that she wanted a hitman so that she could have him unalive her pie biological father, and she wanted him unalived so that she could get her family inheritance. But then, Barnes drops another bomb on them. He tells the FBI that not only was Marjorie in on it, and that not only was William in on it, but that Brian, the man with the collar bomb around his neck, who died, he says that he was in on the collar bomb plot too, and that Brian agreed to rob the bank with this bomb around his neck in exchange for a cut of the $250,000. However, he says that Brian didn't actually know that the bomb around his neck was a real bomb. Brian thought the whole time the bomb would be fake. I guess they were supposed to give him a fake one. So he thought that was fake until it exploded. So anyway, Marjorie finally goes to trial for this and she's sentenced to life. And here's what she looks like for real. I hope that story wasn't too confusing. <laughs> Shout out to Pennsylvania. Shout out to Pennsylvania. That was confusing as hell. There was definitely a lot of cooks in that kitchen. I feel bad. He thought the bomb was fake. Yes, I'm very familiar with Aleister Crowley's ritual that he did back in 1904 on April 8th. And I'm also aware of Jack Parsons' rituals and his ties to occultism as well. One little clue that I'll give anybody that wants to go down the rabbit hole is Apep has a tie to the word Pope. And in my interpretation, the way that they are shooting missiles to study the ionosphere is essentially the way that it contracts and restricts very similar to snakeskin. It operates the same way that we have pores on our skin where basically cold atmospheres or ice will basically shrink the pores and heat basically expands the pores. There's a lot of misinformation where people are saying that they're shooting it directly at the moon when what they mean by basically launching it at the moon's shadow is the shadow that is cast in the path of totality. Because essentially the ionosphere is the firmament that everybody talks about. And they want to study the effects of how the sky literally goes from blue to being able to see the day like it's a, a night sky. So overall, basically what I'm getting from the missiles that are being launched is nothing to be afraid of. They're just collecting data. And the reason why it's called APEP is essentially because that is the snake and basically the ionosphere is like the snake or the Ouroboros. Although I have a theory that one of the missiles might fall. Revelation says a third of the angels will fall. Um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just guessing here. And with the etymology of the word APEP being tied to the word Pope, I'm just saying we might, we might not have a Pope anymore soon. Now, the main problem with Aleister Crowley is that he basically had a lot of religious trauma and essentially became everything that he hated. He couldn't stand the Roman Catholic Church and he couldn't stand Roman Christianity. So basically, he adopted mysticism and then even made all the mystic traditions look really bad with his chosen rhetoric. Now, he never physically harmed anyone, but psychologically, based on my opinion and my research, I don't think that he was very genuine with how he basically got people to perform in certain rites and rituals with him. Basically, way back in the day in ancient Greece, the Eleusinian mysteries were taken very, very seriously. People would travel from all over the world to experience these initiations. But the big key word here is people would go and do it of their own free will and accord. Crowley, on the other hand, decided that he was going to recreate his rendition of the Eleusinian Mysteries and basically put it into a live performance as like performance art or a theatrical event and basically get people to come and watch it and observe basically under a experiment. Now, see, nothing bad happened to these people. They just didn't know what they were getting themselves into. And it basically got a negative review where religious people were basically calling this very blasphemous. Essentially, Crowley had a bad problem of being obsessive about the mystic traditions and was trying to force it onto people, 
which the Elus Coens, basically the, the high priest of the Eleusian Mysteries, this was a very big no-no. People had to come of their own free will and accord. And religion does this regularly, basically tries to force their opinions onto other people, and that's why so many people are drawn away from the modern church. And Crowley was very aware of this, but he basically took that same concept that he hated about religion and then implemented it inside of the mystical traditions. So essentially forcing an audience to watch something that they didn't sign up for exactly basically calls the profane to profane these mysteries that go way, way back that were heavily protected. Because back then, they were protected from people like Crowley. Now, in 1904, there's a very similar situation where Crowley did this with his wife. His wife being Rose Edith Kelly, who, in my opinion, came up a pretty normal life and was basically an army brat who wasn't necessarily into the esoteric traditions. Now, the reason that they got married was to essentially prevent a arranged marriage for Rose. Basically, Crowley was a gentleman and he was trying to play like a Romeo and Juliet scenario. However, I think that he used his gentleman attributes in a way to basically persuade Rose to go with him to the honeymoon in Cairo. Because Crowley was already adepted into the esoteric traditions and was essentially kind of like abusing his power with other people with his influence. So I don't think that he had ill intentions. It's just that he basically worked his magic or basically his influence to get his wife to go forward with the rituals with him. Now, the ritual that he performed alongside of Rose was a ritual that's referred to as the Rite of Abramaline. Now, I don't want my viewers to get spooked by this. This is practical magic in a Kabbalistic sense, where essentially this ritual is designed to initiate you into the servitude of God as well as the divine law, where ironically, this is where Aleister Crowley wrote his book, The Book of the Law. The ritual started on April 8th and then ended on April 10th. And then by the time that him and his wife were done with this, this is where they got the inspiration for the Book of the Law. But the problem here is basically a very similar situation to the people that were brought into the Eleusinian Mysteries. I think just like them, Rose didn't fully know what she was getting herself into. As she's the one who became in a trance-like state, and she's the one who basically gave all of the information to Crowley, who jotted down or wrote the Book of the Law. And this is where he came up with the concept for the religion Thelema. Now, see, the problem is not the book of the law because it's helped a lot of people become better versions of themselves, and that's perfectly okay. But the problem is with Rose not fully being prepared to go into this, as in she didn't fully understand what she was getting herself into, this opens up pathways for certain spirits or entities to use the ignorance of this person to place certain aspects of deception very carefully strategically coded within certain words and phrases. Now, I am not personally a fan of Aleister Crowley for the reasons that I've mentioned in this video, and it's just my personal opinion. However, the Book of the Law 2 is not the problem, it's just the hidden magic that is within the words of the book. Basically, this is where we get the phrase, do what thou wilt, and love is the law. So the intentions are good, it's just that not every single person that is within the know is going to fully comprehend what that means, and then they're going to take it, they're going to manipulate it, and they're going to do whatever they want. This is why people in Hollywood, especially Jack Parsons, took a favor to this whole Thelemite religion because they really like the catchphrase, do what thou wilt. This is exactly why we see Jay-Z, Beyonce, and other influential uh, celebrities basically quoting this or wearing it on their clothes and so on and so forth. Because again, Crowley receiving these revelations, he was very, very passionate about trying to force things on people and trying to get as many people as quickly as possible. And that's not always the, the right thing to do because it brings in or invites negative energy or corruption. Basically, Crowley was not an evil person. He never actually physically harmed anyone. He was just a loose cannon and completely reckless and careless with his actions. And he didn't think about the evil people that would take his message that may have had a genuine intention behind it, but they took it and manipulated it and used it for evil purposes. And that's why we see a lot of evil, corrupt things that are happening inside of Hollywood and then trying to hide behind it being their religion. But with this personality trait of Crowley being a loose cannon, this is why ultimately Crowley is considered to be like somewhat of a laughing stock inside of the esoteric or occult communities. Because a true esotericist or occultist doesn't think about themselves and in the now and in this lifetime. What we think about is future generations and how we're going to help influence future generations with our influence. 
His message comes off as very here and now and not thinking about the repercussions of our actions, which is why we have a very self-centered Hollywood. Essentially, the actions of Crowley basically left a mark or a stain on many different types of organizations, including Freemasonry. From Freemasonry to the Order of the Golden Dawn all the way up until Amork, basically his teachings had a lot of Crowley's personal bias within it, and unfortunately it led to a lot of debauchery. But again, overall he wasn't a bad person, he was just not aware of the repercussions of his actions. He understood that love is the law because love is the law. And this also explains exactly why we see symbolism inside of Hollywood and music videos and everything else. The problem is, is that they're trying to force people into enlightenment and you can't force people to do anything. But the issue is, is that Freemasonry gets the backlash when we don't have anything to do with that. However, Hollywood basically flaunts it openly as if it is a part of Freemasonry and that's just not the case. Because the beautiful thing about Freemasonry is that it is a pure system that has always been about basically allowing people to join of their own free will and accord. And the point in high degrees of Freemasonry is not to experience some mystical woo-woo nonsense and become some powerful magician, which in Scottish Rite we absolutely have the perfect Elu, the degrees that alludes to the Elusinian mysteries where the entire point is people joining of their own free will and accord and then understanding the moral of the story. Now, for those of you who are willing to learn more about the Eleusinian Mysteries, me and Psycosmos are going to be doing another workshop very soon. And I'm thinking the first subject that we're going to go over is the Eleusinian Mysteries. So if you would like to participate inside of this workshop, there's going to be no mystical woo-woo nonsense. We're just going to go over the history of the Eleusinian Mysteries and ultimately just revealing the moral of the story rather than getting into any type of magic whatsoever. So if you are interested of your own free will and accord, go to the link in my bio and sign up. Some to be. And that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed tonight's rabbit hole. If you haven't already, please take a second to just smash that like, subscribe, ring that notification bell. Just to make sure the algorithm knows what's up. So what we're gonna do, y'all, is shrink. Run these numbers up. Thanks again. Until next time.